Hey everyone, welcome back to Rule of Two. Today we have a very special guest, Paul Hirsch. Uh, this man needs no introduction. He has edited some of your favorite films, including uh, The Empire Strikes Back and A New Hope, Carrie, The Secret of My Success, which I think is a very underrated film, uh, Warcraft, Mission Impossible, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and so much more. How you doing, sir? I'm fine, thank you. It's an honor to have you on the show. Um, <coughs> And, uh, you know, thank you very much for doing it. The honor is mine. So before we begin, Paul has a book that we would love to promote. I've linked it down below in the description. You guys can find it on Amazon. And it goes through Paul's entire uh, history and experience uh, being a Academy Award winning direct, uh, uh, sorry, not director, editor for some of your favorite films. And you guys can find that on Amazon. You can find it anywhere in a bookshop, uh, but I've linked it down below. So if you want to pick it up, it's available on Kindle, print, everything. So Audible. Audible, all that oh, stuff. Oh, nice. Who read it? Who read the book? I forget his name. Uh, uh, I'm told I never listened to it because I knew I'd find fault with it. So I just didn't bother him. But uh, I'm told that he did a very good job. Awesome. That's good. So I would love to hear about your journey being an editor and how you got into star wars and you know your experiences with george and everything i, I want to dive deep into all of this stuff so well please maybe you can around. narrow narrow down your point of interest because you mentioned a lot of different things there point of interest as well all of them i would say the main one being star wars so why don't we talk about right. that okay but even that has a lot of, you know, you know, going yeah, on a lot of backstory. There's a lot yeah. of backstory so, to get whatever to sticks out, whatever you feel like talking. So about basically, it. you know, basically, I'll give it a little bit of of shape. So, um, in your career, you started out working with the great Brian De Palma, and yeah. um, you know, one of your earlier films, Carrie, which is just like you know an absolute horror masterpiece based on the Stephen King novel. If 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 some of the listeners out there haven't haven't seen it, it's it's truly a haunting film, especially still, with that. It still holds up, I think. Uh, I mean, it holds up incredibly well. Um, so Brian De Palma um, was a member of this kind of a creative troupe back in the day called American Zoetrope. Um, and uh, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, they all seemed well, to kind of hang out in this little clique. Well, they were not part of Zoetrope, but they knew each other. Uh, Zoetrope was mostly uh, uh, Coppola's company and... George Lucas was working there. Um, Walter Murch worked there and some others, but Brian and uh, uh, Scorsese were in New York and Spielberg was in LA. So even though they weren't um, working together, they knew each other because they were sort of coming up at the same time and they were all uh, united by a love of movies that uh, you don't, it's not the same today as it was then. But anyway, um, I had done a number of pictures with Brian. I started out cutting trailers and uh, my brother produced uh, two films in his life. Uh, one, one of which was called Greetings. Mm. And they came to me for a trailer for Greetings and that's how I met Brian. And then they produced Hi Mom, which was originally entitled Son of Greetings, which mm -hmm. meant to be a sequel. And Greetings is about three guys who were three young guys who were trying to get out of trying to avoid the draft and avoid being sent to Vietnam. And Hi Mom uh, was the story of one of these guys who did not succeed and was sent to Vietnam and has come home after the war. And he's played by Bob De Niro in his first starring role. Mm. Cool. So that was Hi Mom. And I was 23 at the time and I knew nothing. Wow. I knew absolutely nothing. But Brian took a chance on me and uh, it kind of worked out. And uh, I did four more films with him before I worked for anyone else. And the fifth of those films was Carrie. Um, the third of those films, let me think. No, it's this. Hi, Mom. This is, yeah, Phantom of the Paradise was the third film I did with him. And at a screening uh, of Phantom of the Paradise, there was an after party, and I was introduced to George and Marshall Lucas, which is mm. where I met them for the first time. 
And Marsha was very outgoing and friendly. And she said, oh, you know, we really love your work. And I want, you know, and she dragged me, she caught me by the hand and dragged me through the crowd to meet her husband. And George was, uh, had made this phenomenal hit with American Graffiti. Mm. I think to this day, it's one of the most successful films of all time in terms of return on investment. It cost, I think, $700,000 and made 50 million. Wow. So it's like 70 to one return on 71, 70 to one return on investment. So, uh, but he was legend already. And, uh, Anyway, so that's when I met him. And um, sometime later, uh, Marty Scorsese was directing Taxi Driver, and Marsha was one of his editors. She had cut Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore for him. Mm. And um, I had gone on and cut Obsession for, for Brian. And Bernard Herrmann was the composer. And he was the composer to be on Taxi Driver. And anyway, Marsha called up and she said, can you come out to LA and help out on Taxi Driver? And she says, you know, Benny, and it would be a big help to have you on the picture. And we just have so much film. And so I said, yeah, I'd, I'd be delighted. I'd love to. So she called back the next day and she said, I'm sorry, but the studio refused to bring anyone in from New York. They said the, they didn't want to pay per diem. There's so many editors in Hollywood. Why would they have to mm. pay to bring somebody in from New York? <clears throat> so that was that. And um, anyway, uh, I went on and after Obsession, I cut uh, Carrie for Brian. And while I was working on, uh, in the pre-production period of Carrie, George and Brian uh, were both looking, to, he was casting Star Wars and Brian was casting Carrie and they were looking for actors the same age. Mm. So they decided to have casting calls together. Wow. So they, they'd, have these, they'd have these cattle calls and people would come in and they'd, Brian and George were sitting there and, and George would give the opening speech. And then if the actor or actress wasn't uh, someone that it was any, you know, they could see right away that they weren't going to make it. George would, um, rather Brian would launch into the closing speech. And sometimes he would start the closing speech before George finished the opening speech. Well, so, 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 so Carrie is a Sith Lord. There's a shared universe between Star guess, Wars yeah. and Carrie. Yeah. Well, the, the guy who played Tommy Ross in Carrie was hoping to get Luke Skywalker. Mm, interesting. <laughs> I never so knew he this. Didn't get, he didn't get the part. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, during one uh, during a break in the casting sessions, they uh, Brian called me. I was back in New York, and he said, "Listen, George wants to speak to you." And uh, I had this image of Brian grabbing George around the neck and dragging him to the phone. And uh, anyway, George was very nice. He said, "Listen, I really like your work, and I'd like to work with you someday. I'm doing this picture now." that I already hired someone for, but I'm gonna be doing one after that and then maybe we can work on that together. I said, great. And I went home that night, I told my wife about it. I said, you know, but I really kind of wish it was this one because uh, I, all I knew was the, the title, Star Wars. And just, yeah. you know, up to that point, space films had been Journey to the Moon or, you know, stories about Mars, and Saturn, or e even um, 2001, which was the most, forward looking of all the films I'd seen at that point was about Jupiter, you know, so it was all within the solar system and sure. The idea of Star Wars, you know, some really distant place in space was just the title alone was very exciting. So um, anyway, George went off to England to shoot Star Wars and um, Brian started shooting Carrie and I stayed back in New York. And he was sending me dailies. And uh, while I was working on Carrie, I was invited to a friend's house, a fellow named Jay Cox, who's a screenwriter who's worked with Scorsese a number of times. And um, he invited my wife and me over to dinner with his wife, Verna Bloom. And he had been to England and visited the set of Star Wars and uh, had brought back a book of production stills and there were shots of stormtroopers and and Chewbacca and 
um, uh, R2 and 3PO and the, the sand crawler and the Jawas. And I saw these, these pictures and I thought, oh my God, this looks amazing. Yeah. And uh, again, I went home that night and I said to my wife, I said, you know, I really wish I could work on this movie. Right. And uh, so that was that. And then uh, at around June or so, George finished production on Star Wars and he and Marsha flew into New York from London on their way back to the West Coast. And by that time, Brian and I had a cut of Carrie. We had a screening for them. And uh, uh, then they flew back to California. And about two weeks later, I got a call from Marsha saying, listen, we're kind of overwhelmed with, you know, having to recut this movie. They had let, they had fired the editor who did the cut in England because hmm. they were so unhappy with the cut at that point. And they uh, had hired Richard Chu in California, but they had to recut the picture from, from beginning to end. And Marsha was uh, tasked with building the end battle sequence, which was a full-time job for, for many, many weeks. So uh, Richard was recutting the film and it wasn't going fast enough, so they, they needed extra help. So she said, can you, can you come help us? And I said, am I going to get a call tomorrow saying the studio won't permit it? Right. Yeah. yeah, fair and, question. And uh, she said, no, 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 this is completely different. This is George is in charge of this one. And so I, I went home. And, you know, the problem was my wife was one month pregnant at that time with our first child. So I said this to Marsha. I, I said, I have to go talk to my wife because she's, you know, She's just one month pregnant. And Brian heard this and he said, what? Don't tell Marsha your problems. Mm -hmm. And he picks up the phone. He calls her back. He says, Marsha, he'll do it. This is what we're paying him. Can you pay that? <laughs> okay. You know, and he, it's a deal. He'll be there, you know. So I went home and I said to my wife, I said, you know, that picture that I kept saying I wish I could work on? They offered me the job. So she said, do it. So Awesome. Wow. Yeah, awesome. she was great. So I, I had to finish up on Carrie, and then I flew out to uh, to uh, San Francisco and started working on Star Wars. So that's how I that was how I came to work on the picture, which I think was the original question. Absolutely, it's a long, uh, long answer to a short question. No, it, so, I, it was a beautiful story. You took me through the whole thing. And um, so, one one of the most fascinating things that. Like, I remember really having conversations with my friends about this. Like, I don't know, maybe at this point, it might be 10, 15 years ago. Um, but, of course, that that picture uh, ended up winning you guys the Academy Award, which must have been an exciting uh, moment in and of itself. Um, did you guys, uh, were you actually at the Academy Awards? Um, oh, yeah. Did you, did you, how did it feel to work on the space movie and then, win one of those little golden statues like just before i get to my actual question i'd love to hear a little anecdote about that well during the broadcast the during the commercials somebody got on the pa system in the room and they'd say okay winners uh keep your thank you speeches short if there are multiple nominees choose a spokesperson you know and uh uh, don't be, you know, thinking about the 400 million people watching the program. <laughs> so no pressure. Anyways, no pressure. So yeah. I spoke to Richard and Marsha, who were my co-nominees, and we agreed that we would ignore that. And we would all we would each say, uh, you know, we would each take our turns. And uh, as it turned out, I worked on the picture for more months than anyone else. So they put my name in first position. Um, so anyway, uh, they called, you know, uh, they called Star Wars and we went up there and, uh, I gave my little speech. When I look at it now, I think to myself, how is it possible for a person to go 45 seconds without breathing? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to breathe while I was up there, but anyway, uh, I was very nervous and, um, uh, so then I finished and I turned to Marsha and the band started up and they, and Marsha and Richard started to walk off the stage. 
Right. And you're like, what about our deal? So, so, uh, we got in the wings and I said, what happened? And she said, well, uh, just as they announced that we were winning, George turned to me and said, don't thank me. <laughs> and, uh, you thanked everyone I was going to mention anyway. So I didn't see any point in saying anything. And then Richard said, well, I saw that Marsha wasn't going to speak. So I figured I wouldn't say anything either. So, <laughs> So that's how I wound up being the the spokesperson. So do you, so I have to ask this, okay? And as Paulie, yeah. you know, uh, don't worry if you if you don't have an answer for it. Is the statue somewhere near you? Yeah, it's it's yeah. nearby. It's oh wow, oh, look, yeah. at that. Yeah. look at that! Look at that! An cool, Oscar man. for Star Wars, man! How Jeez. cool is that? How cool is that? So um, to that point. Um, there was about 10, 15 years ago, I forget the exact time frame, uh, the AFI created, or maybe it was even longer, the AFI created their 100 best movies of all time. Um, and Star Wars was one of the movies uh, chosen uh, as the 100 best movies. And then they were going to submit all the films to the National Archives. Um, and the there was this little controversy at the time. This is back when George still owned Star Wars that George sent in a copy of Star Wars that was his altered uh, version of it, right? Because kind of like Walt Whitman, that's the way I like to think about it. George kept iterating his films over time and made changes and tweaks as he, the creator, saw fit you know, to make them. Um, mm -hmm. However, the AFI, I'm sorry, the, the National Archives requested uh, the original cut, the cut that you guys made originally because... It was the Academy Award winning cut, and that was the cut that they wanted to preserve. And to my knowledge, to this day, George has never sent the original cut um, of the film. It's still the one that he chose uh, you know, to send them. What, what are your basic overall thoughts about that? Do you think he should have sent the original one that you folks did that won the Academy Award? Or is it okay that because it's his creation that he sent the iterated uh, version? I support George in anything and everything he wants to do. Amen. So I have a question. <laughs> I, I want to, well, yeah, me, me too. I support him no matter what, but as a fanboy. But uh, I got a question about The Empire Strikes Back. I'm going to jump right into the scene, the iconic scene, uh, you know, where Vader says, I am your father. And right. I want to know, you know, <laughs> when it came to editing that, and we see yeah. the mattresses down here and everything that no one got to see in the film. What was your perspective on that scene in general? Uh, was George sitting next to you when you were editing that, or was he just no. like, hey, just go for it, you know? No, I always work independently on my first cut. Uh, it's only when I present it that I start getting uh, comments and notes and criticism. Right. But, uh, you know, when I assemble the scene for the first time, I'm operating autonomously. Yeah. I mean, I can, you know, you, you look at the dailies, you sort of understand the intent. Yeah. You have a script and you follow the script and you see what the shots are and you, you can sort of understand that, you know, this is meant for this and this is meant for that. And uh, you have an image of the finished sequence and, um, you know, I, everyone says, and I think it's true that if you took six different editors and give them the same dailies, you'll get six different versions of the scene. Mm -hmm. So even though the, the intentions are, uh, you know, it's an interpretive art. Editing is interpretive. So uh, I, I, to me, it's like, you know, a dance, a dancer hears the music and doesn't really know how he's going to dance to the music till he hears it. And something about the music inspires him to, to do something or another. Um, yeah. And uh, it's like that with, to, with me and dailies. I, I watch the dailies and it's, oh, that's great. got to use that. Mm. And, you know, you get an image in your in your mind, and you, you follow that. You follow your instinct about it. In this particular scene, they were um, there was a tremendous uh, wind effect, if you re recall, and um, they produced this by using enormous fans. When I say enormous, I mean the motors propelling these fans were, I think. Uh, Volkswagen engines with enormous blades to get enough wind and they've produced an incredible roar hmm. 
to the to point that the sound recordist on the set couldn't record any sound. Now, most of the film, uh, I forget exactly. I, I, my recollection is that none of the original tracks were used in the final film, that everything was replaced. Well, I don't, that's probably not true, but uh, it was close to everything had been looped. Mm -hmm. But that particular scene, um, we didn't even have guide tracks to loop to because they had to shoot essentially silent. So I had to uh, sort of read, you know, read uh, Mark's lips. Of course, wow. Vader, Vader, you can lay anything. Yeah. Out because he's, just, <laughs> he's just wearing a mask. You don't have to yeah, worry yeah. too much about yeah. lip sync. Did you, uh, did you know that he said, I'm your father? Or was that still kept a secret at the time where he said, Obi Wan that was still a, your That was still a secret. Oh wow! I think he said something like "Obi Wan killed your father" or something. Yeah. I forget. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's funny. I I little blurry on that, but uh, it's interesting. Over the years, the the fan base has built up, uh, you know, an interest in things that that I really find sort of irrelevant, but mm. uh, I know they matter to a lot of people, like. Uh, you know, Greedo shooting first or Han or, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't. Who I cares? Don't the, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I thought we got it right in the first place. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't even remember how we did it, but I, I thought it was fine when we did it. Well, I, uh, I read a lot of the, uh, the making of books. And uh, one of the things George said in the making of A New Hope was that, uh, if I remember correctly, I'm paraphrasing, is that, he wanted Greedo to shoot first because he didn't want Han to seem like the instigator that just goes in there and shoots. So that settles that. But then so many fans, you know, have their own rhetoric around it, I guess. So it's what makes it fun. So the original cut, I had, I had Greedo, uh, I had Han shoot first. Okay. Did I? I don't remember. I, I don't know. I still yes. don't know to this day. But, but in, in, an, in that write-up, when the, uh, the making of A New Hope came out, George said, oh, I wanted Greedo to shoot first. Right, but in the original cut, changed. Han shoots first. Yeah. Under the table. Yeah. Bow. Right, yeah, I guess so, yeah. Because, yeah, you know, well, Han, it, Han, Han's a scoundrel. He's a badass, you know, and it's, yeah, sort, of like the moment, it's sort of like the moment in, uh, in Raiders where, Han, where uh, Harrison shoots the, the guy with the scimitar, you know? Oh, that's a great scene. That's yeah. a great so scene. It's, to me, it's not much different from that. You know what one one thing um, that I'd love to get your little you know to get your insight on is you know editing to me is where the magic of filmmaking really kind of starts to come together because all of the acting, all of the shots, all of the coverage um, really starts to take shape on the editing table, and then the the almost like the frosting on the cake is the music right and the sound design and stuff like that. And yeah. when when do, do you have a recollection when you started seeing the John Williams music take shape on top of the images that you were splicing together? Well, we had constructed a fairly elaborate temp track for Star Wars. Mm. So when John saw the picture, he wasn't just seeing it silent; he was seeing it with our with our choices of music. Do you, do you remember and what those choices were? Uh, what, I do. It? I remember very clearly. And I've given lectures at USC to the composing class that the whole class is all about temp tracks and how they shouldn't be afraid of them because if John Williams can deal with temp tracks, they can deal with them too. Mm. You know, if John... Awesome. I, I mean, I've played some of the, the cues that we had in there uh, for the class and then I play John's cue and they gasp sometimes at how close uh, John's music is to the, to the temp cue that we had in its place. But, uh, you know, of course, John is a brilliant, one of a kind composer. And uh, there are times when he recognized that our choices were spot on and he, he did something similar, although he, transformed it into something fresh and uh, there are other times when he thought yeah okay we can do that but I, then he would improve on it he would add something to it that we hadn't thought of or we hadn't been able to introduce because we're working with already recorded music 
Yeah. But uh, no, John is John is a you know it's interesting the 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 metal sequence at the end of the movie was cut to a um, uh, New World Symphony by Dvorak, and mm. uh, in my in this lecture that I give, I take the scene and I put in New World Symphony in place of John's music, and you can see that it was cut to that. And then John's music fit into the same shape. Interesting. Wow, that's awesome. So yeah. all, all of the fans out there, you know, that's a cool fan video waiting to happen. New World Symphony by 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 whom? Anton Dvorak, D-V-O-R-A-K. Cool. Czech composer. There's also another another moment in Star Wars that uh, I had done two pictures with Bernard Herrmann. Mm. Um, and he and I had become very close and he had died the previous year. And there's a moment where the Millennium Falcon has been captured aboard the Death Star and they're searching the ship and some stormtroopers go by and then a hatch opens up and we see there's a dialogue scene that ensues where they're talking about, you know, we got to, I forget what they're talking about. Anyway, <laughs> at that point where the hatch pops up, I thought the perfect music for that would be a cue from Psycho by Bernard Herrmann. Mm. And it has a very distinct uh, three note signature. That's if you know the Psycho score, it's totally familiar. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I put that in as they open the hatch. And then as they start the dialogue scene, the music goes under and John uh, knew Benny and was, uh, uh, recognized the cue, of course, and when he wrote his cue for that scene in the movie, he quoted that three-note signature at the beginning. Wow! I mean, he changed it after that, but um, so it's a little tidbit if you want to uh, get out your psycho score and then see how the oh, score in Star this, Wars. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's the score first in Star Wars matches it. That is awesome, chat. Take notice of that. You know, that's two videos for the chat already. That's that's awesome. That's and um when when um what what was the biggest difference between working on Star Wars um the first one in 1977, episode four, and the Empire Strikes Back? Like, like what was the one noticeable difference between both experiences? Well, the biggest difference, of course, is that I was the last one hired on Star Wars. Um, they had had an editor who they put together a cut they were unhappy with and they were recutting and I was just trying to, you know, my, my brief when I came on the picture was fix it, you know, <laughs> fix, <laughs> fix it. Um, they, you know, they'd give me a scene. I remember the first scene I cut, George and I looked at it together. It was the robot auction Yeah. where, uh, where Luke and his uncle acquired R2 and 3PO. Yeah. And uh, I said, gee, I don't know, George. It, it looks pretty good to me. And he said, he said, I said, what do you want me to do with it? He says, well, I thought so too, but Marsha thinks it could be cut better. <laughs> I said, okay. So he left me with it. And then I started getting into it and looking at the outs and looking, you know, and then I started working on it. And when I had finished, um, it was a three minute scene instead of a four minute scene. Mm -hmm. And there was more in it than there had been before. So uh, I picked up the pace quite a bit and uh, gave it a kind of rhythm it hadn't had. And uh, so it was sort of like that going through the film. I was fixing, I was fixing somebody else's work. And I was also working with two other editors. So we had agreed, I mean, these were formidable editors in their own right, Richard, had worked on One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and The Conversation, and uh, Marsha had been uh, working with Scorsese. She worked on Taxi Driver. She'd cut uh, American Graffiti, you know. So um, we had agreed that we would show each other each other's work so that since all our names are gonna be on the film, we didn't wanna present something that the other editors might have a problem with. So it was sort of, so that, you know, protocol of trying to respect other people's sensibilities, that was absent in Empire Strikes Back because I was the only editor. 
Right. So I was on it right from the start. That was the big difference. And I could cut the scene right in the first place instead of having to fix somebody else's work. And uh, yeah, so. You know, was, go ahead. Was there, was there a scene? Go ahead, please, Paul. I was saying it's kind of liberating just to do what I wanted, you know. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to go in there and fix someone else's whatever they did. Right. Was there a scene particularly in um, four or five that you really wanted to be in there, but George was like, nah, we've got to cut it for time? Or how long was the whole thing going to be, anyways, without all the cuts that they had to make for the theater release? We didn't cut a whole lot. I mean, okay. any cuts we made were for clarity and. Uh, the big changes that I remember were the opening sequence. There had been some action with Luke on the planet during the battle in the in space before C-3PO and R2 launch out of the, mm -hmm. um, the ship and land on the planet. So we took that out and, and, and what happened was when, they, when the robots land on the planet, you don't know there's anything living on the planet. They land in a desert. Mm. Whereas before there had been this scene with Luke and his friend Biggs, a lot of exposition about the academy, you know, the, that they went to and the, the rebellion and, the, you know, a lot of exposition that we did. We were going to find that stuff out anyway. It was unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And it sort of disrupted the flow of the action at the beginning. Yeah. So we, by taking that out, we, we streamlined the storytelling so that there was this incident in space and then we follow the robots down to the planet and it's sort of a more organic storytelling than interrupting this action with a scene on the planet and then going back to space and coming back down again. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was one big change we made. And the other uh, was taking out the scene with Jabba the Hutt, which we didn't need. Um, and there was, uh, I think, another scene or two. Uh, I remember a scene of Vader walking and talking in one of the th hallways in the Death Star. It was, again, it was some not very important dialogue about I don't know what. Uh, but we we didn't have a big time problem, you know. It was it wasn't uh, t over long. Um, Empire we locked one month after the end of production. Wow. wow. So so there wasn't a lot changed in that at all. Of of that final shot uh, with Vader and Luke, were there any other angles that were shot than just the ones that we saw from maybe Vader. like from far away or or Vader and Luke? Yeah, yeah, at the end there. Of oh, that. that scene, yeah. Were there any more well, I... fight sequences or? Because something that that so many fans wanted to see with Seven was that there were talks and rumors of you know a, a a flashback sequence or a vision of that scene in particular, but shot from a different angle that we've never seen before. Whether they're going to recreate it or you know take it from the editing room or not, something that was never used. I'm just wondering if there was any other scene or or um, angle that was shot from that particular moment. Not to my knowledge. You'll mm -hmm. notice that the if you go back to that shot, you can see the. Uh, the set was a uh, forced perspective. Uh, actually, not this angle, you can't tell, but that background wall, when the mm -hmm. camera is shooting down, the, um, the set was designed to create the illusion that you're over, you know, an endless, yeah. bottomless, co you know, uh, column. Right. So it only you couldn't you couldn't shift the angle very much because the set forced the camera position. I see. To, to get that strange force perspective. Got if it. If you move the camera, you destroy the illusion. So it had to be in a particular at a particular angle with a particular lens for the. And then the matte guys at ILM added to the set to make it look like infinite depth uh, and yeah infinite right. depth yeah. You, no, there was you know, no other angles. For for all the folks out there who um, are familiar with the art of editing, uh, most likely 95% of the audience has edited on Final Cut Pro and Adobe Premiere and, you know, iMovie and stuff like that. And it's all pretty much, you know, 
drag and drop and cut, cut, cut. It's all very, very simple. Um, could you walk the audience through a little bit about how different it actually was to edit on steam backs with film strips all over you and like the, the, the differences in the craft back then till now? Well, as I point out in my book, um, editing is not a technical process and editing is not about the tools. I've never used Adobe Premiere, Final Cut Pro or iMovie and I don't know how they work. Uh, I've worked on Lightworks and Avid, uh, Media Composer, that's about all I know about uh, digital editing. But I can say this, that thankfully editing is not technical because if it were, I'd be out of business. Editing is a mental discipline and an aesthetic that has nothing to do with the tools that you're using. It's all about choosing a succession of images and choosing the proper order for those images and deciding when to get into a shot, when to get out of a shot, in what context to use it. Uh, and then there are larger storytelling questions. You know, Should we introduce this bit of information sooner or later? Should we hold it back? Should we do a flashback? Should we shuffle the order? Uh, is this shot in the right place? Is it the right length? Is it preceded by the correct shot? Is there a better context to show this? None of those things have anything to do with the tools that you're using. It's all an aesthetic about storytelling. And uh, you know, it's like writing is not about the pen. Nobody says that Shakespeare would have written better plays if he had had a word processor. Mm. So, uh, editing is not technical it's just not technical it's um it's a mental discipline i suppose i heard an interesting uh talk about uh a question that somebody raised about math and they said is mathematics an invention or a discovery mm. and i thought you could say the same thing about film editing is film editing an invention or a discovery? Because there are things that happen when you join two pieces of film that seem uh, perfectly natural and understandable. And then there are other situations where you put two pieces together and uh, in somebody's phrase, it makes your toes curl. It doesn't work at all, you know? Yeah. So uh, it makes me think that there's uh, something about film editing that resonates with uh, something in our minds, in our perception of our understanding of reality and how we construct uh, an image of reality for ourselves that, uh, you know, maybe we've discovered something rather than invented it. But it's, a, it, it's a sort of an interesting question to toss around. Yeah, no, that's, first of all, it's a fascinating way to look at it because you're absolutely right. When, when I look, you know, I kind of started out my career editing stuff and, you know, I feel like when I see a bad cut, it's almost like when I hear something that's out of tune, it's like almost any human can tell you that's out of tune. It's a, it's this instinctual thing. And yeah. with editing, I feel the same way when you see a bad cut, it's like, you know, like you said, your toes curl, you know, like there's something, there's something deeper going on. I never thought about it that way of editing and mathematics being a discovery versus an invention. I'm going to have to wrap my head around that some more. That's a fascinating way to look at it. And I think a lot of people don't really understand how important editing is when it comes to a film because you have, you're basically a, a storyteller in a sense where you're putting everything together. You're like a puzzle master. You're taking all these different pieces and clips and putting it in a nice flowy way that can tell the story properly instead of it being jagged and uh, off-putting. And I think you did a phenomenal job with all of your films. Thank uh, you. Bring in another uh, uh, film out there, uh, The Secret of My Success with Michael J. Fox. If you guys haven't <laughs> seen it, you should check it out. Me and Mark love awesome. that film. Yeah, that's an yeah. awesome movie. And Ferris Bueller's Day Off, of course. I mean, you know, who hasn't seen that one? Um, I mean, Blowout is such a good one, too. You know, um, let me ask you one little question because we always talked about this in film school. Yeah. Was Blowout Brian De Palma's inspired version of Blow Up? We always had that argument in film school that it's almost like a retelling of Blow Up, but instead of visual, it's sonic. Is that was that actually something going on there? Well, certainly with the title, uh, the uh, at one point I think the the project was called Personal Effects. Um, 
which, you know, uh, but I know that the inspiration for the film was not blow up, but it was um, a sound effects editor that we worked with named Dan Sable in New York. And Brian asked him once, you know, where'd you get this sound? And he said, well, I, I go out and with my microphone and I, and I record stuff. And Brian sort of took off on that. And this is where he got the idea of, you know, uh, Travolta with the earphones and his, <laughs> his mic out in the, uh, in the woods at night recording owls and leaves and, you know, wind in the leaves and so forth. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, um, I mean, literally but all the, par the parallels are, you know, you're absolutely right. They're very strong parallels. And, you know, I was yeah. in, you know, in Brian's early career, he was frequently accused of plagiarism. He was accused <laughs> of ripping off Hitchcock and, you know, and I thought anything that smacks of plagiarism is something that Brian should stay away from. But Brian's right. a very tough guy and he's very uh, courageous and unafraid and he does his thing. So, when I pointed out to him that, you know, it was so close to blow up, he, he didn't care. He, no, it's right. A, it's because, a like, title. you know, blow up um, was, was about digging deeper into the image, of course, to, to discover this crime, very Jorge right. Luis Borges and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And blow out obviously was digging deeper into the sound to, right. you know, uncover exactly. this crime. Yeah. Exactly. You know, one, one other Brian De Palma thing, because I'm a huge Brian De Palma fan. There's kind yeah. of, um, you know, there was a documentary uh, where Brian De Palma kind of attributes um, Mission to Mars as the reason he quit uh, Hollywood. I know you edited Mission to Mars. Was Mission to Mars really that weird of a production? Um, well, there was another Mars picture that was being worked on at the time at Warner Brothers. And we were at Disney. And I remember a Disney executive came to the set in Vancouver and we were standing there and I said something like, you know, it'd be nice if we could have more time because they were putting the screws on us to come out before the other picture. And I said, you know, we could do a better picture if, if we had more time. And he said, it's more important that we come out first than it'd be a better picture. Mm. That was the studio's position. Yeah. Ouch! Not so. So I'm not sure what other conversations took place between the studio and Brian, but um, there was a lot of pressure to to finish quickly. Mm. Understood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's unfortunate. Right. Was there a particular project that you enjoyed? I mean, I'm sure you enjoyed all of them, but was there one that you, sticks out to you the most? Um, gee. And I love I love cutting uh, musical films, mm. oh, uh, wow. films with films with musical sequences, and uh, you know I Phantom of the Paradise was one, um, Footloose was another. Uh, I did a picture called The Fighting Temptations, that had uh, Beyonce and uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. If you don't know it, it's got some really fabulous gospel numbers in it. Uh, the OJ's are in it. And uh, um, what else? And of course, you know the parade sequence in Ferris and um, Secret of My Success has Bow, wow, know, wow. Seven, <laughs> seven or eight uh, montages cut to music. So, yeah. Um, it's yeah. Too I, bad that's, you that's, didn't do a Rocky film. I mean. <laughs> The whole thing, <laughs> <laughs> or or even Return of the Jedi, that one scene there in the in Jabba's palace that they added in. Bah, bah, bah. <laughs> oh, gosh. I forgot her name though. I can't remember. Um, uh, well, we're 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 coming up on your time here. I uh, we'll probably just ask a few more questions. Uh, Mark, go ahead. I know you got a couple. Oh man, I could keep going and going and going and going. Um, speaking of that musical thing in particular, um, and also you mentioned. Um, you know, working um, with, um, um, you know, kind of, uh, kind of, I'm going to butcher her, Hernan, um, uh, uh, the, the psycho composer. I'm the name Bernard is, Herman. Bernard Herman. I always confuse it and, and put the sec the last name as a first name, but right. did, did you, um, 
as a sort of student of the art form, were, were there other filmmakers and other editors where you looked at and uh, and were inspired by their use of sight and sound when it came to like musical numbers that you kind of took some inspiration from? Yeah, I steal from anyone. Anything I see in the movies that I think is cool, if I can use it, I'll do that. You know, uh, I think one of the great things about editing is sort of it's, it's an international language and you can see foreign films and see things that editors from across the world have done and sometimes it applies to something you're working on at the time and uh i think it's uh it's you know i was told that when sound was introduced uh, one of the great losses that everyone experienced was the feeling that film was an international medium those silent films you know, Buster Keaton or Charlie Chaplin, I mean, everyone could look at them in no matter what country and understand and relate to. So there was this international communication. It spoke, these silent films spoke to everyone. Whereas once it was sound, it only spoke to people who spoke that language. Interesting. So, um, yeah, I, I think that uh, this is how the, the art of it, editing advances when uh, editors all over the world are watching movies and they get, inspired by something they see in somebody's film and and uh, pick it up and use it in their own yeah you know there's there's so many moments like that and you know um footloose and and, and a lot of your films had it in martin scorsese like so yeah. many great music cues and music supervisors that that um you know that work with them stanley kubrick all these guys like you know when when you can bring that musical element into a cut is when you can really give that power. You know, there, there's something very interesting. That's kind of my cheat, is that I feel like whenever you need a little bump in a cut, you just find a great cue with a great cut to like give it that launch. Um, it's a very, very or or, or you can be inspired by visual things as well. I mean, like all the the wipes that we use in Star Wars, those are mm. based oh, on I the, love this. Yeah. those are based on the Republic serials that the, uh, uh, Star Wars had been inspired by, you know, the early uh, 30s, uh, used those wipes. I used them in Hi Mom, my very first film. I used a lot of wipes, and uh, I always liked them, and they seemed to be appropriate to the genre of Star Wars, and we used them, and then that became a sort of a signature aspect of... Um, it's a great point. ...of the later films. Is there fact, a psychology... To the, to the wipes, like using this wipe versus that wipe, was there a, a lexicon or a vocabulary about which wipe to use for what effect? Well, it depends on the action of the, se of the scenes that you're connecting. You know, uh, sometimes um, it, 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 it varies depending on the action is basically the answer. Mm. Uh, the, the, the intention was to make a, a smooth or, you know, an elegant transition between two static shots to so introduce some motion into a static transition instead of just a cut or a dissolve you have something moving across the screen or opening up or you know you can do all sorts of things but uh, and then the other situations when you have you're transitioning from a static shot to a moving shot or vice versa you're going from a moving shot to a static shot a wipe can help you in those situations I have a question for you that, uh, and you can debunk this. I don't know how valid it is, but there was an article written uh, a little while ago. I forgot who wrote it, but um, essentially they said the Empire Strikes Back had an original ending that was later, when released in theaters, after one week was recut. Is that true? Was there a different? Know. I don't remember that. Okay. <laughs> well, I guess not then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't. I've I don't never know. heard that. I wouldn't swear yeah, my yeah. memory being a hundred percent accurate. So. <laughs> um, do are there any questions from the audience that you uh, might want to ask? Uh, the audience is pretty happy, man. They're just like, "Oh, Paul's a legend. This is such a cool stream. <laughs> We're so happy to learn." You have about fourteen hundred people here watching you, and, and then no, like, really, yeah. wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, there's a lot of your fans here, and they they really love you, wow, uh, just as you. as we do, and we want to be respectful of your time. So, I mean, yes, Mark, do you have any? Do you have any more yeah. questions? Yeah. I'd like to talk a little bit, you know, as we kind of close out, just to put that thought back in, in people's minds, because I've sure gotten a lot out of this that I think can inform my own creations. You know, I fancy myself a, 
um, you know, a filmmaker of sorts. Um, can, can you talk to me a little bit about the process of writing your book and the kind of things that you wanted to put into the book and the kind of message that you wanted to sort of impart to the audience with your book? Yeah, well, I, um, I got the idea actually when I was in Vancouver uh, on a picture, I think it was Mission to Mars actually, and I was um, there alone. My wife had stayed in Los Angeles. Uh, it's very difficult for spouses when your partner's on location because if I go on location, I have a job, I have a purpose in life. I have people I see every day and things to do. And my wife comes along, she's in a city, she doesn't know anyone, she has no job, she has nothing to, to do and she's lonely and uh, you know, has it's very difficult. So we decided that she would uh, stay back in LA on this particular picture. So on the weekends, I found myself alone and bored. And um, during the week, I'd been on the set and I'd been sharing some of these stories with people to, you know, I like to tell stories. And uh, I was telling some of these stories to people with some success. And I thought I should really write these stories down. You know, so I started writing the stories down and uh, then it occurred to me that uh, I had a number of really good stories to tell and I started to make an outline based on each of the pictures that I'd got. And I remembered incidents, you know, I had met this person or that person and this happened and he said this to me. And I just sort of made an outline of uh, little um, things to jog my memory about uh, each of the pictures. And um, then that was in 1999. I finished the first draft of the book in 2017. Oh, wow. So I worked on it for 18 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> but, okay. But I was, I was working on it on and off. I mean, if I, if I got busy at work, I would abandon it for three years or, or whatever and not touch it at all. Uh, and when I'd go back to it, I'd look at the outline again and I'd, I worked my three way through the outline till I've written till I'd written everything that I had put in the outline. Of course, you know, at in 1999, I was I had taken notes on 30 years up to that point. And then there was another 20 years that followed, so I kept adding to the outline uh, things that happened to me on the subsequent projects. So anyway, by the end, I had uh, fairly you know 50 years of work. He developed a lot of stories. I showed it to a friend and uh, he said, oh yeah, I'll edit it for you. And instead of editing it, he would say, well, how did you feel when this happened? You know, and he wanted, he wanted more. Mm -hmm. So, um, and he helped me a lot. And uh, a man named Nick Meyer, who directed the second, fourth and sixth Star Trek films. Oh, those, yeah, Nicholas wow. Meyer. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I love yeah. the sixth one. To me, that's like the most underrated of all the Star, uh, Star Trek films. I love that uh, one. So anyway, uh, and then he introduced me to uh, his agent. And uh, um, I, I didn't want the book to be a textbook. I always find how-to mm -hmm. books extremely boring. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that. And I thought, you know, I have some of these good stories and it's enough. I'll just tell the stories. And then I met with this agent and she said, uh, uh, some of these stories that you're telling sound like score settling and it's, it's not a good idea. We don't want to put out any score settling. And I thought about it. It was about the time that Comey had written a book about Trump and he talked about his orange skin and his small hands. And <laughs> he managed to cover himself with as much shade as he was trying to throw on Trump. And I thought, <laughs> There's a lesson there, you know, and I thought nobody wants to hear. And I've been so fortunate in my career to work on such good projects with such good mm -hmm. people that nobody wants to hear me whining about this guy was, you know, rude to me or this guy was, he didn't listen to me. Or, you know, nobody wants to hear that. There's no whining on the yacht is my motto. Mm -hmm. No whining if you're on the yacht, you know, and I feel like I've been on the yacht. So. Nobody wants to hear me complaining about this, that, or the other thing. I thought it was a very good note. So we took all that stuff out. There wasn't that much of it. There was a couple of people that got under my skin, but, you know, but um, and that was, you know, and then I worked with a very good editor, a book editor, 
who helped me bring it down. Um, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the way it worked out. I never, and I never thought people would find it uh, as instructive as they seem to. Um, I guess they, I guess there are things you can pick up from it that I hadn't anticipated. And, uh, I'm very gratified by when readers reach out to me on Facebook or something and, and tell me how much they like the book. It's very, uh, it's unexpected and, and very, uh, very gratifying. Where That's can awesome. your, your fans, uh, follow you? You have a Facebook, you said you have a fan page there. I, I don't. It's just, just me. Okay. Okay. You don't have an Instagram or a Twitter or anything like that. It's good. I'm old. That's a good choice. Yeah. I'm old. Yeah. No, no. You're wise. It's a different. No, you're smart. You're you're yeah, you're, you're, you're from a better time. I, I would say. Uh, yeah. I was born in 1990, and uh, I I started Star Wars with Episode Four, Five, and Six, and then of course the prequels came out. Would you? Did you enjoy those films? What do you think of them in, in terms of the leniency from you know four, five, and six? Did George ever speak about the prequels with you, or? Yeah, uh, not specifically, but I knew that he had in mind three trilogies, and we we sort of so one to nine. About, sorry, one to nine, three trilogies. Yeah, yeah. and uh, but you know very vaguely, and I said it would be cool, you know, if. Uh, if you know, thirty years from now, you made a picture with the, all the actors, bring all the actors back, and now they're older, and yeah. there are younger characters that the movies are about. Yeah, which is how it turned out. But uh, nothing specific about what he was going to, what he was planning to do. Um, I thought the first three films. Uh, uh, I really liked the third one best Me of too. the three, and in retrospect, I thought that. There wasn't really enough story in one and two, and that one, two, and three could have been one movie. Mm -hmm. uh, how Vader got his mask, you know, it's like how the Lone Ranger got his mask. The origin stories are always so interesting. Um, and then uh, seven, I thought, was really smart, you know, going back to Tatooine, Tatooine and uh, seeing all those wrecks lying around the desert reminded me of the, the the broken toys in my closet that my kids had played with. You know, <laughs> it's a good way to look at it. Uh, it yeah, wasn't it was Tatooine, but, uh, they, but close they, enough. Yeah, yeah. They, they called it another planet, but it was the same yeah. idea. It was the same idea. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. So, and then I don't know. Then I felt that the subsequent films sort of lost. Um, they lost some of the fun that you know. I, one of the great things about the first film was how much fun it was. And there was, mm. there was a comic aspect to it. Certainly 3PO was, it was comic and, and Kirshner really uh, picked up on that in his, um, in this, in uh, Empire. Mm. And I think that somehow got lost in the later films and became more about myth building than, than fun for the audience. It's mm. a good way to look at it. I see. Although I thought the Mandalorian had some of that fun uh, in the first few episodes, mm -hmm. but, I agree. Uh, but then I thought that the uh, the writing uh, I liked the show less and less as I watched it. <laughs> but that, I thought the effects are extraordinary. Oh, of yeah, course, yeah. yeah. They're they're using that stagecraft now, and that's next level stuff. Um, Mark, it's six o'clock. Paul has been very, very generous with his time. Yes, thank uh, you so much, Paul. Thank you so really much. We really appreciate and speaking remember, with you. We could speak with you for hours and hours. But yeah, the you, link, the link to the book is down in the description. You know, please make sure you check that out. And if if we can learn, um, uh, you know, this much on a on a simple one hour chat, I can't imagine how much gold is inside that book. So thank you for sharing your time with us. You're we welcome. appreciate you, and, and thank you so much for your work and uh, editing the movies that made my childhood and teenhood and adulthood and uh, yeah. so I mean, many I, other people. I wish you had the sound bite of the bow, wow, wow. <laughs> <From> <laughs> Maybe season. next time I'll, I'll put that in there, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, chat, we will see you later. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, 